Hi everyone. Uh, we are going to start the webinar now. It's already past three. Uh, welcome to the Presto on uh, Cubol webinar. I'm Shubham Tagra, and I am an engineer in the Presto team at Cubol. I've been uh, working on Presto for quite some time now since we started offering Presto as a service on Cubol, and have seen Presto go through a lot of paces uh, to from where it started and now where it is at a production ready system being deployed at very large companies. Um, so today I'm going to I'm going to take you through uh, some of those uh, old learnings, some of the things that we have done, uh, show you certain demos, and then talk about the customer cases that we have seen. Right. So I was saying that I am going to take you through the Presto introduction, covering little basics about Presto. Talk about uh, what we have uh, on Presto as service at Cubol, then talk about certain optimizations that we have done at Cubol, which are also uh, we have tried to contribute it back some of them to open source as well. Show you demos to show those things in action. Then talk about certain customer use cases we have seen where people try to fit Presto in. And then at the end of uh, the webinar, we'll take questions and hopefully we have a uh, good half an hour uh, for these questions. All right, so let's get into it. I'll start with the Presto introduction. I know uh, a lot of you would already know what Presto is, but for the benefit of everyone, I'll briefly introduce you to Presto. So Presto is a distributed SQL query engine, which was open sourced by Facebook, Facebook in uh, 2013. And uh, it is a completely ANSI SQL compliant uh, system, which uh, is capable of uh, querying multiple data sources, right? What that brings in is uh, that users can write federated queries where they can talk to multiple data sources like Hive, MySQL, Kafka, etc. at the same time and, and do many powerful things like cross joins across these data sources. Uh, Presto, apart from this, is, uh, is very performant. Uh, we'll, we'll see what uh, aids to this performance in the, in the later slides, but there are a lot of nuances that have been built into Presto, which helps it to perform much better than the other products that are available right now. And it is highly extendable. And, and, and when I say extendable, this extendability is to multiple data sources. Um, it is very easy right now to look at the existing um, code in GitHub and extend to any data source that you have right now, which Presto does not support, so that you can talk to th uh, those data sources via Presto. Uh, and as we go into the slides, we'll have some examples from customers. But uh, even before that, uh, I'll tell you that we have seen that Presto has proven itself at scale. In Cubol, we have large customers like Lyft, Adobe, Iron Source, Ola, which have multiple deployments of Presto, multiple clusters ranging anywhere from few tens of nodes to hundreds of nodes. And even outside Cubol, uh, Facebook has proven its, uh, uh, Presto has proven its worth in companies like Facebook, Netflix, Uber, and LinkedIn, which again run multiple clusters with lots and lots of nodes to basically uh, provide solutions for interactive uh, use cases to their analysts. All right, so let's briefly touch upon the Presto architecture. It's very similar. If you're uh, familiar with Hadoop, it's very similar from a high level. It's very similar to Hadoop. You'll have one special machine called coordinator, and then you'll have multiple worker nodes, uh, which coordinator manages and submits job. The client, uh, at the very beginning, would connect to the coordinator and submit a query. So this, the, the, a major difference from Hadoop is that this is tailored only for SQL. It's not a generic execution system. So clients are going to talk to your coordinator and submit queries. This query would be parsed, analyzed, and a plan would be generated. And this plan would later be fragmented into multiple tasks and scheduled across multiple worker nodes. So all of this is done at compile time in coordinator. And to uh, do all of this work, coordinator has to talk to the data source that this query is using. For example, if you're using Hive, you're using Presto to access Hive. In that case, your coordinator will 
uh, use Hive APIs to fetch the information about the Hive tables that are being used, for example, what is the scheme of the table, what are the columns, etc. And then at a later phase in scheduling, it will fetch information about what are the splits, what are the files uh, that are part of this table. And depending on uh, what worker can access what files, it will schedule those files uh, as splits on the tasks that were submitted to worker. Right? At uh, the lower side of this diagram, you'll see there are multiple workers drawn in. And what this is showing right now is a execution tree where you have two workers which are drawn in parallel to each other. They are working at the source level. And then at the top level, there is another worker doing some work. The uh, source level workers are executing a task which was scheduled on them, which will have certain operations. And to execute that operation, they'll need to talk to the data source. Now, this data source, as I've earlier mentioned, could be anything. It could be Hive. It could be MySQL. So these workers would call the APIs from the respective data source APIs and read the data, do some partial work if necessary, and pass on the result to the worker at next level. So if you have to take an example, if you were to take an example for this, uh, assume this is a simple count star query. Uh, so how this will be distributed is that two workers would be reading certain parts of your table. right? Half of the table is read by worker one on top, and the other half by the second worker. They would be partially aggregating the counts of the parts that they have read and stream that result to the worker on the top, which is aggregating that result as a final result. And the final response at the end of query return to the client. The important things to consider uh, in this example, which uh, will give you an idea about why Presto performs uh, much better than others is the first thing is at the scheduling stage, the split scheduling is streamed. Uh, so Presto scheduler does not wait until all the uh, splits are calculated. Rather, as and when it sees new splits, it will schedule, it will stream those splits to the workers. So example, if you have a table which has lots and lots of files, so calculating splits on that file could be a time, very time consuming operation because you know that reading or listing files from uh, cloud stores like S3 is a slow network call. So Presto would continuously uh, fetch the information about these listings. And as and when the listings come through, it will create task items and submit to the worker nodes. So there is no uh, blocking of the pipeline. And whenever the work is available, it gets scheduled. The other important part is that your workers are working completely in memory. Uh, the intermediate data that they have calculated is not written to disk. It is directly streamed to the next uh, worker in your execution pipeline. Right? So there is, Presto does not incur any cost of writing intermediate data to local disk or HDFS or read that data back. In, in the later stages. So that also improves performance. Finally, uh, another point to note is that all of this is completely pipelined. What I mean by pipelined is that when your worker is, let, let's take an example. If your worker at the source is reading few gigs of data, it is not going to wait until it has read all the data. It will chunk the data into, let's say, a few MBs. And in each batch of these few MBs, calculate a local count and pass that information along to your main aggregation worker, which is uh, on the top in your execution plan. So with this pipeline model, your complete cluster is being utilized. right? Otherwise, your worker at the top level would have to wait until your source workers have finished. So Presto utilizes a pipeline model to further increase performance. So these are a few of the points uh, with, uh, with which Presto uh, is how fast it is right now. There are a lot more points internally in terms of uh, uh, the features around performance built into Presto, which actually deserve a separate session in, them in themselves. But this is going to give you a good idea about what are the differences at a higher level, which uh, makes it perform so well. Right, so let's cover how Presto as a service is provided at Kubol and what are uh, the main points. We'll cover uh, all of these in more details in, in the future slides. But to start with, uh, when you uh, come into Kubol and run Presto, you get a completely managed Presto offering. And as we uh, proceed in, in the slides and the demos, you'll see how easy it is to use Presto at Kubol. Apart from this, uh, Kubol uh, is present in multiple clouds, uh, which means that we also offer Presto in multiple clouds. So you could come in from clouds 
major clouds like AWS and Azure and try Presto, uh, running compute on these clouds and also uh, have the ability to access the cloud stores of these clouds. Right? And uh, for all engines, not just Presto, uh, Kubo believes that uh, cloud is the right place for uh, the data analytics workloads. And to be performing at cloud, uh, you have to be optimized for, for the cloud. There are several differences when you're working in cloud versus when you're working on-prem data centers. So those optimizations are really necessary to extract best out of your cloud framework. And Kubol builds a lot of these features uh, within its offering so that we perform uh, as good as you could when you're running on-prem. We'll see what are these few of the features are that we have built in in, in the later slides. Apart from uh, the benefits which we have built within Presto, there are a lot of things that you'll get right out of the box from the control tier which we have uh, in Kubol. And the most important part from that is the cluster lifecycle management. Now, when you come into Kubol and submit a query, you don't have to have a cluster running. You don't have to worry about how big your cluster is. You don't have to worry about terminating your cluster. All of the lifecycle of a cluster is taken care of automatically. Other than this, there are other features uh, and tools uh, and APIs which Kubol provides you. Uh, for example, Rubik's, which we'll again cover later on. Uh, better integrations like uh, Tableau integration, mode integration, various other BI tool integrations via Kubol, ODBC, JDBC drivers. Your SD the SDKs Kubol provides over Python and Java. That makes uh, your the work the work for end user a lot more easier. The automation task is very easy if you have uh, these REST APIs or SDKs uh, available at disposal. Right? And then uh, we have a lot of things built into the system to uh, to be cost effective. Right? And we'll see a few points later in the slides. And to be enterprise ready, there has to be a focus on security. And there are features that we have built in right from the control tier in and in Presto as well that helps you get the best security that you can. Let's see what these features, how these features show up to the end user, right? How do they impact you when you come into Kubol versus when you launch your own cluster or launch Presto somewhere else? So at Kubol, you get a much richer user experience uh, on Presto. So there are multiple aspects to it. For example, we, we have a much uh, a richer functionality set built into, into the Presto uh, version which we have. And to give an example, we have uh, built, we have extended the grammar of existing Presto system to support uh, other SQL syntax, which open source does not support due to its limitations of ANSI SQL. Uh, one of the example is uh, insert directory and insert override queries. People coming from Hive background, uh, they are very used to writing queries which have insert directories and insert overrides. And it's also useful for short ETLs if you're doing that on uh, Presto. I, and because NC SQL does not support these syntaxes, open source uh, Presto does not have it. But we have built this uh, extended grammar into the Presto distribution that we have at Kubol, which helps a lot of people who come who are migrating their workloads from Hive into Presto. Apart from this, there, we have extended Presto to have authentication schemes, which we'll cover later on in the security angle. But this gives you a much uh, better experience because uh, it becomes very easy to leverage certain security angles even if you don't have the high-end solutions like LDAP or Kerberos uh, installed on your end. Apart from functionality, there are multiple extensions which we have over open source Presto. Uh, for example, we have additional connectors at disposal, one of which is Presto Kinesis, which gives ability to uh, Presto to connect to Kinesis streams uh, in the real time. This connector is available in open source and you can look it up uh, at Kubol's uh, GitHub handle. Other than, apart from connectors, we have additional surveys which we have uh, baked into the Presto distribution. And these are important because if you are running uh, your queries on Hive and migrating to Presto, you would want a seamless transition. And it's possible that there are a lot of surveys which are present in Hive uh, all are common across Hive use cases, which are not uh, available in Presto out of the box. And from our experience, we have tried to put in a lot more additional surveys so that users do not have to uh, have any, any sort of problem when they're migrating from Hive. 
the other major pain point for presto had been a difficulty in writing udfs uh, which is uh, user functions so we have uh, open source project which is again available at cubo's github handle which helps you write these udfs and provides a easy pluggable point uh, within cubo presto so that you have all the user functions that you wanted available for presto we have also written a lot of hive functions uh, which are not available in presto so that migrating your existing hive workloads to presto uh, becomes easier apart from these things to get a better user experience it's always good that you are able to connect to system from various places and from the system you are also able to connect to lot of the data sources right so we provide uh, we have a partner partners team which uh, is responsible to provide a rich user experience when it comes to bi tools like mode tableau looker etc and uh, since we cubol is a multi cloud uh, company we support multiple clouds and presto also is able to uh, work with the multiple clouds and multiple uh, cloud data stores for example we have the extended support for azure uh, data lake which you wouldn't find in open source presto coming to the performance features a uh, lot of this we are going to see as a demo as well in the later slides but just to talk you through from on these uh, we have additional features like dynamic filtering join reordering s3 optimizations these three I'm going to cover later on. Apart from that, we have a very interesting feature called Fast Copy, which uh, provides you with a service which is completely managed by Cubol, which will create optimized versions of your table in a sorted fashion, so that your queries transparently use these um, better versions of data for uh, faster execution. Apart from that. Uh, as you'll see in the later slides that stats uh, the statistics on hive tables is becoming more and more important to extract best performance out of any system not just presto even hive or spark it's best if you have the statistics generated but it is difficult for users to keep track of which tables have the statistics generated uh, and when to invalidate these statistics and when to regenerate the statistics if data is updated cubol provides a solution to uh, these problems by uh, providing a self a cubol managed service which can trigger these sort of uh, invalidations and uh, auto stats regeneration jobs which will which helps tremendously in performance when it comes to features like join reordering and dynamic filtering as we'll see later apart from performance uh, one of the important factors when it comes to data admins is the cost perspective right and when you are on cloud you would want to leverage uh, the economy of scale that cloud provides and also all possible uh, ways to save costs and to that end we provide multiple features like auto scaling and spot nodes uh, which i'll explain to you in a little while which help bring down cost by a big factor finally as i was mentioning earlier that to be enterprise ready uh, there has to be focus on security and we provide a lot of features out of the box which uh, users can enable by a single click and get a highly secure deployment of presto uh, for example we have a fully uh, encrypted uh, presto system uh, as a service uh, mode where even in case of auto scaling where nodes are coming in and going out of the membership of cluster you uh, you will be able to have a fully encrypted channel between all these nodes uh, we also support storage authentication this the storage authentication is an extension or, or rather a very important piece to uh, cover high complete high authorization this uh, captures the case where you are running a cluster with a uh, credential uh, which is quite more powerful than what each user uh, runs uh, by themselves so if a user is supposed to not read a particular uh, bucket while your cluster is powerful enough to read those buckets storage authentication will make sure that these these uh, problems are taken care of and only the people who are supposed to read data in s3 are uh, able to read it via cubol clusters apart from the presto native features uh, you get a lot of feature security out of uh, cubol control tier itself uh, and one of the important points there is the cubol hackles so you could uh, the admins in cubol can control a lot of things in terms of what user can take what actions what commands they can execute what it, what uh, actions they can take in terms of cluster management so all of this 
provides a, a very good way to provide security uh, in your uh, enterprise solution. And finally, coming to a very important point about insights, uh, it's always useful if uh, you know what's going on with your system, right? And uh, it's even better if the system can tell you that there is something wrong with it and you could then step in in time and take some uh, preventive measures before the problem becomes a disaster. Right? So for that, we provide a solution uh, with Datadog monitoring where we publish a lot of metrics, set up some dashboards on your Datadog account and sets up alarms. Uh, for example, if your uh, cluster is getting out of quorum, we will issue certain alarms which will help you to come in, step in, and take certain actions. And if you're confused, you can always talk to Kubel support uh, to work through the solution. The other important part is uh, AIR, which is the data intelligence system which Kubel provides. AIR can monitor uh, your uh, usage patterns and can give you insights about your tables, for example, the hot tables, the, the, more, the most commonly used columns, et cetera, and can give you recommendations around based on your usage patterns, what are the best partition columns that you should select for your table, or what tables that you are using are in non-optimized format and would benefit the most if you convert them into uh, columnar formats, et cetera. These are sort of insights help you extract much better performance over time when you're running your workloads on Kubernetes. And finally, coming to the ecosystem part, uh, Kubel, uh, apart from the UI, the SQL Workbench it has uh, provides you with JDBC, ODBC drivers, multiple SDKs as we talked earlier uh, in Python, in Java, you get REST API. So you have multiple options uh, at your disposal uh, when, you, when it comes to automating or scripting your workloads. You also have an option of using notebooks, Presto in notebooks out of the box so that you could visualize your data uh, very easily and all of the infrastructure is hosted at Kubel, so this uh, is completely out of the box. And finally, the Kubel goodies, which you get in terms of Kubel in general, you get multi-cloud readiness. You could drag Presto in any cloud, which can be a daunting, daunting task uh, depending on the cloud you're working on. You get automatic lifecycle management for the cluster, which we talked earlier. You get a very good SQL workbench, which gives you uh, options like query versioning, you, templates for the query and a scheduler inbuilt. And the most important part uh, that you get out of Kubel is the support. Uh, you have uh, a highly experienced team of support, which can which has seen a lot of uh, deployments across a lot of customers and has seen a lot of issues, experience in solving those issues. So these folks can help you get to your answer much more faster. All right, so this finishes the first part. I'm going to get into the optimizations part where we'll see a few demos and a few features in details about what those are and how those benefit uh, performance. All right, so the first, the first feature I'm going to talk about is joint reordering. Uh, even before I get into joint reordering, I'll kick off a query in Kubel. Uh, because it's going to take some time. So I have a cluster which is running, a 20 nodes C3 4x large cluster. And I'm going to run multiple queries and compare the performance across different runs. Uh, I, have, uh, I have query 91 from the TPC, TPC DS data set. This is exactly, uh, this is completely unchanged. This is as, as it appears in, uh, in, in your TPC DS. And I'm going to run it on a cluster which I'm running called Webinar, which I just showed to you. Right, so there is this query executing. Let's get back to the theory while this query executes. So what is joint reordering? Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, almost all of you would know that in case of inner joins, it doesn't really matter uh, from the results perspective that uh, what is the join order. For example, if you do store sales join customer or you do a customer's join store sales, the result of the join, if it's in a join, is going to remain the same. But this is not the case uh, for engine. Um, I mean, it's not the same thing if you do A join B versus B join A when it comes to the uh, engine part. For example, in case of Presto, if you are doing store sales join customer, the customer table, the table which is appearing on the right side of join, 
will uh, be used to create a hash table. And the table which is on the left side, store sales in the first example, would be streamed in batches and would be matched against the hash table that is created on your customer table. The other case here is when you do customer joins store sales, your store sales would be used to create your hash table and your smaller table, which is customer, would be used uh, to do the matches against this hash table. Now, the problem is that if your hash table is bigger, in case in this case, in the example which I showed you, if you are doing hash table on store sales, you are going to create a much bigger hash table. The chances of getting hash collisions is much higher because of which the total cost in terms of performance is going to be much higher for the second plan, which is customer joint store sale it, versus store sale joint customer. So it, uh, Presto right now expects that the user who is submitting the query knows what are uh, uh, the data sizes for the tables they're using right, and provide a right order. So your smaller table should always appear on the right hand side. And if you have a multi-join query, then your joint tables should be in the decreasing order, order of their sizes. Now, this is fine when it's a couple of tables. Right? You, you, uh, user might know that store sales is a fact table and customer is a dimension table. So they would always write customer on the left hand side. But this is not the case when it comes to multi join queries or uh, sub queries. So let's just see this example. So in this example, we are joining seven of these tables, right? And it's very difficult to keep track of what is the uh, comparative value of the sizes of these tables. So this table, this query right now took around 57 seconds to execute. I'm going to execute same query with an additional session uh, config called, called Qbol reorder joins. And let's see how this performs. Right. So let's just run the full query. I ran the subsection of it. Let's look at the history tab. And my query is finished. So the original query took 57 seconds. And the query, same query with join reordering enabled, took 10 seconds. So all, already a 6x improvement. Right? And this is just because that the right order was uh, generated when your feature was enabled to enable join reorder automatically. To see the complexity of it, we'll see uh, how this the join uh, tree looks like for the query. So the, the join tree on the left side is for the query without optimization, and join tree on the right is with optimization. So uh, uh, the catalog returns table in all of these queries is the biggest table. But because of the way the original query is written, the original Q91 is written, it comes at the uh, left uh, as the uh, right table to call center because of which the whole table uh, is used to create hash, hash table and the complete execution is slowed down. While once you apply the optimization, the joint tree is transformed and your catalog return table is pushed further left, becomes the leftmost table because it is the largest table. And it's no more used to create hash table. Rather, it is just streamed to match entries against the hash tables created with the smaller table in the query, which helps you uh, get the performance which uh, which you saw just now. We have uh, we have a very good uh, blog post out for join reordering, uh, and uh, and these are the numbers from that blog blog post. We have seen uh, as high as six x performance improvement and no performance degradation with join reordering enabled. So this is one. This is a great feature if you are looking to extract uh, best out of uh, Presto. All right. So coming to the second feature, dynamic filtering, we'll follow the same same idea here, and I'll start. This is Q forty five from TVCDS. I am going to start a normal version of it. And while this is executing, let's look at what dynamic filtering is. So dynamic filtering is a, a runtime filter, which is generated while the query is being executed. Looking at one of the tables, if we, if we can figure out that we don't need to read the complete table, uh, second table, then we can filter a lot of values from that second table at the execution time. Uh, 
this is explained better by an example. So this is an example where A is joined with table B on a join key. And as you can see that the cardinality of join key uh, on table B is very small. There are only five entries for join key. What we can do is that at the runtime, when the table B has been read completely, we could push this information about join keys into the reader of A. So this would be the task which is executing uh, reading of A. We could push this as a filter, which could be pushed down completely into your readers. And we can eliminate based on uh, the input formats that, that are being used. You could filter a lot of data that is being read and transferred into the blue stage, which joins A on B on that join key. And because uh, you have uh, cut down a lot of data that is being joined, your query execution is definitely going to be faster. Let's see this in action. So my query, original query, finished in 1 minute and 16 seconds. Let's start. This is the same query with an additional session property called dynamic partition pruning. Right, so this has started. This is going to be quick. We don't need to switch back. Yeah, as you can see that the query is progressing much faster and it has finished in under 20 seconds. The query which was finishing in around 75 seconds is finishing in 20 seconds now. But this is yet another feature uh, which helps you get the best out of best performance out of Presto. Um, we have uh, pull requests pending in open source and we are uh, trying to contribute uh, this feature back into open source. But with Kubol, you could try it out today. I am running this query in the production environment of Kubol, right? So this is available out of the box in Kubol right now. How uh, dynamic filtering ha helped uh, the query is, uh, uh, threefold. It could do a runtime partitioning pruning. Um, the example which I showed you did not have partitions. It was completely unpartitioned data. So there wasn't a partition pruning step involved. But in case uh, your uh, filter can be used to prune partitions, then uh, the runtime filtering, your dynamic filtering, will uh, remove certain partitions so that no tasks are even submitted for those partitions. Another thing is that it could uh, do a runtime predicate pushdown. So in this example, the a dot join key, the set of keys, this could be pushed down right into the reader. So if it was an ORC data format, we could push these keys as a predicate into ORC reader, and the reader would then utilize this information to um, apply this filter uh, on the row groups that it is going to read. And it could cut down the amount of data itself which is being read from S3, and that is going to save you the most uh, most time because you are now not reading the data altogether, whatever is not required. The final is that uh, if, uh, uh, apart from a predicate pushdown, it could also filter the table scan data. So let's say this, uh, you were, uh, the dynamic filter was at a stage which was not actually reading from a table, but rather from another substage. So what this dynamic filter could do is that even though your yellow node would, would be uh, having a lot of data, but the filter would, uh, cut down the data that gets transferred to the blue node, right? So if uh, table scan had gone ahead, it, it could not push the predicate down. It would still bring down your network, uh, the amount of network data that is being sent between the yellow node and the blue node, and that will still get you a lot of performance gain. So this is uh, this is again in the block which I was talking about. We have seen. Uh, a lot of improvement in terms of uh, um, uh, the, the time saved. We have seen improvement as big as 5x. And because of uh, the amount of data transfer coming down, the amount of data processed coming down, a lot of queries that were not earlier passing in the same setup were not passing on TPCTS. The 14 queries like that have started uh, to now succeed after applying dynamic filtering optimization. All right, coming to S3 optimizations part, uh, it is very important when we are working on the cloud and accessing cloud stores uh, that you have uh, an optimized reader when you're reading data from the network. Because 
when you compare HDFS versus S3, the, the, the major difference is that your HDFS is all local or rack local within the same data center, while S3 is completely outside in the second network. So the cost of reading data uh, and writing data is much higher. So, and not just uh, about reading and writing data, there are other operations uh, like rename, rename operations, which are very costly in S3 because rename is internally converted into copy and delete. So if you're renaming a one gig file, you are essentially copying full one gig and then deleting the old one gig file. So this is very costly rather than just point, changing some inode pointers. So the first optimization that we have is about direct writes. Uh, in Kubol, when you are uh, writing data using Presto, uh, we are not using any staging directory. But what we do is that in case of failures, we clean up the data that we, we wrote. Right? So what, how this helps is that you're directly writing the data. And in majority of the cases, when you have successful queries, you're not paying the cost of renaming uh, data from your staging directory to your final location. And only in the case your query has failed because of some reason, you're paying additional cost of cleaning up that data that partially was written during query execution. Apart from this, there are uh, intelligent seeks which, which were built in and also contributed to uh, open source Presto, where uh, the intelligence has been put in where you do not seek uh, unless required. So there are, uh, with the optimized data formats, there are a lot of file system level seeks done. And each of these seeks, if not done intelligently, you would be opening a lot of connections and closing a lot of connections, which could uh, be a, a performance drain in your queries. So intelligently doing seeks and making seeks no operation when not required is very important to get best out of best out of your uh, S3 readers. Apart from these optimizations, there are multiple caches which uh, we have built inside Kubol for Presto. Um, we cache uh, file listings, we cache file details. And these are very important to speed up your uh, uh, query scheduler so that you don't have to again and again um, get into S3 and fetch this information. And when it comes to ad hoc uh, analysis use case, there is always a repetitive pattern in terms of what uh, tables and what files are being accessed by the users. So the cache hit in case of uh, file listings and file details is also very good. The other cache which we have is for instance credentials when you're using roles, right? instead of again and again getting into uh, EC2 metadata service to fetch cre temporary credentials, you could uh, cache those credentials and use them until they are valid. This not just helps improve performance, this is also essential from functionality uh, angle because if you overwhelm your EC2 metadata service, you will start seeing failures in your queries. Apart from metadata caching, uh, Kubol also provides data caching. So we have a project which was uh, open sourced a year back called Rubix, which, uh, which is used at scale today with, by a lot of customers of Presto in Kubol. And this provides you ability to cache data and uh, reuse whenever possible. This works seamlessly with auto scaling, upscale, and downscale to give you the best best cache it uh, that is required. Um, the Rubik system is not just limited to Presto; it could be used uh, for uh, Hive as well as Spark. And if you are interested, you can always go to Kubo's GitHub handle, and you will find the source code for Rubix and uh, full steps and management system as well for uh, installing Rubix on your Hadoop systems. All right, coming to the auto scaling section. When you are, uh, one of the important differences when you are uh, running in cloud versus when you are running on premises that clouds provide you this ability to add nodes on demand. Right? If you are on prem, you would always want to have all your nodes up and running. But when you are in cloud, where you could always add nodes and remove nodes and only pay for what you use you would want to auto scale your clusters depending on your workloads. And Kubol helps you uh, do that uh, by providing minimal configurations to Kubol. If you get to the clusters, you have to, uh, the, the bare minimum configuration that you have to provide is what are the minimum slave nodes that you want and what is the maximum slave node that you would want for, uh, for this cluster. And, if you have provided five to 20, Kubol would start up only five nodes. And as and when it sees that there are more queries uh, and the cluster is overutilized, it would scale out the cluster, add, add more nodes as required. 
and then also later on downscale uh, the cluster. Now, uh, this scale up decisions are done based on certain parameters uh, to meet a deadline for, for the job that is uh, being executed. And these decisions have to be intelligent uh, rather than just based on your CPU usage or memory usage or tracking certain metrics around number of queries that are being utilized. Because it can so happen that you are running query uh, or queries on a cluster. But even if you add more nodes to that cluster, uh, it wouldn't help those queries. In that case, you, you wouldn't want to add anything to your cluster. A very simple example for this is that you have an order by query. And an order by on, uh, on the full data set can run only on a single node. Right? And if, you, if your query is getting choked on the execution of order by, even if you add 100 more nodes to this cluster, the performance will not increase because the bottleneck is still a single node which is doing full ordering. So the Kubel order scaling system uh, is uh, cognizant of this fact and can take intelligent decision and could scale and would scale up your cluster only and only when it can help performance. The more interesting part is scaling down uh, the system, right? So scaling uh, to ensure that uh, your scale down does not interfere with the currently execution executing queries. Uh, appropriate uh, logic has to be built in your system that you could put your worker nodes in graceful shutdown so that they could continue to run whatever they are running right now, but they do not accept any more uh, queries. So when Kubol sees that, or when Presto and Kubol sees that your cluster is underutilized, it determines what is uh, the optimal size that should, you should be running at and would mark the remaining nodes uh, into graceful shutdown. And once workload has been drained from those nodes, those will be removed and your cluster would shrink to a lower size. So this can save a lot of money. We have a lot of customers using uh, auto scaling and they save, they save millions of dollars because of auto scaling. Apart from the, the simple uh, things which I explained in auto scaling, uh, we also provide final controls if you are a power user in terms of uh, group scale up and scale down or uh, providing cool down periods, which would be useful if you are having a bursty workload. Uh, it's possible that you have a uh, burst of data, burst of queries coming in, which would scale up the cluster and then there is silence period and then there are more queries. You wouldn't want your system to take away your scaled up nodes just because there was a silence period for some time. So those uh, those things can be those things can be configured depending on the workloads that you are having and appropriate knobs are provided for auto scaling. Finally, uh, getting into the spot support uh, that we have, um, just to touch upon what spot nodes is, so that everybody is on, on the same page. Uh, AWS uh, provides you. Uh, with the spot market, which is the extra capacity which uh, AWS has. Uh, and uh, it provides these nodes on a very discounted price. Uh, we have seen customers saving as much as 90%. So you get the spot nodes at a 10% value of the actual node. But uh, there is a catch to it that AWS can take away the spot node uh, whenever there is uh, increased demand in the market. So this requires your uh, system. Uh, so if you, if you have a system which is fault tolerant, which can recover from a node loss, you could use uh, spot, mark, spot nodes to save lots and lots of money. But if your system is fault intolerant, which Presto is, which means that during the execution of query, even if a single node goes away, your full query fails. In that case, you wouldn't want to use uh, spot nodes because with any uh, changes in the spot market or the spot prices, your queries would start to fail. And you wouldn't give a predictable performance to your uh, users. But uh, to help you with that, we have integrated well with the spot nodes. And uh, we provide two features which help users to use spot nodes with Presto. The first feature is spot termination notification. Spot termination notification is a AWS construct where AWS gives you a two minutes notice uh, when it say when it is about to take the node away, right? So if you have two minutes. Your node will get a notice that two minutes later you will be shut down, and if your application can be uh, made aware of these notification and take some uh, actions on top of it. So what we do in uh, 
Kubol Presto is that we uh, listen to these notifications and whenever we receive this, we mark the nodes in graceful shutdown so that no new uh, work items are accepted into the node. Apart from that, we also trigger an aggressive scale-up. So as soon as one node receives a termination notification, we also trigger uh, 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 an action to AWS to uh, give us one more node, uh, on-demand node, so that by the time this node is away, the cluster quorum could reach back to whatever it was right now. So what this means is that if your queries are finishing under two minutes, none of your queries would fail if you are using Spot on Kubol on Master. Uh, on Presto. But there are still cases uh, that queries could be going beyond two minutes and they might fail. And to prevent failures in those queries, uh, we have a feature called query retries. So query retries is there uh, as a fallback mechanism when the spot termination notification was not able to handle uh, a query failure. So in this case, what we could do is we could retry the full query uh, and there is no lower granularity in Presto that you could retry a query at. It has to be a full query level retry because the pipeline model, which I explained earlier in the start of the presentation, uh, puts up this restriction um, that if one of the tasks goes away, all the data which was in memory of that task goes away completely. So you could not resume that task again. So the easiest way or the possible way right now is to retry the query. But retrying the query also has to be intelligent. You cannot blindly retry a query. And that intelligence is what we have uh, built into the query retries mechanism. So the most important thing that has to be taken care of is that you have to retry query only when your changes are rolled back. So it's possible that you, are, you have written a query which is inserting data into your table. Right? And now if your query has failed because of a node loss and you want to retry that query, you have to ensure that you, all the data that partially was written for uh, this failed instance of the query is rolled back. And only after that, you submit a, a retry of that query. Other than that, uh, similar to uh, on the similar lines that we were talking about uh, auto scaling, the retry also only retries only when it knows that a retry could finish. For example, if, you, if your retry failed uh, due to insufficient memory in the cluster, it is going to retry only after it sees that the cluster size has increased. And now there's a possibility that we could uh, run this query in the cluster because of more memory available. Uh, similar thing for the node loss as well, that um, it will not retire a query until and unless it sees the cluster size, size stabilizes, which uh, works well with what, what, with what I explained in the previous slide about we uh, uh, spinning up more nodes as and when we figure out that the node is about to be lost. So if a node is about to be lost, we'll add more nodes. So your cluster size would quickly stabilize. So your query uh, should not wait a long before it is being retried. So these are the features which we have uh, built around Spot and uh, which enables users to use Spot instances in Presto. So this was all I had around the features part. Um, lastly, I'll cover uh, some of the customer use cases that we are uh, seeing on um, on Presto. So most important uh, and the, the widest use case that we see today is the interactive uh, uh, use case. People use this as an interactive query engine for the data analysts and product managers. Uh, apart from that, it's also being used for reporting use case where you know, people want to create report and visualizations using BI tools like Tableau, Looker, etc. cetera. Uh, another, another place where Presto <coughs> fits in is uh, federated queries. And this is a trend which we are seeing is on the rise, where people want to do joins across multiple data sources that they have. Uh, probably, for example, they have um, their historical data in uh, Hive. They have some last three months data in Redshift. And they have their up-to-date data in MySQL or some other data source. And they would want to uh, join uh, the data across all these data sources to have some insights. So that this use case is becoming more popular and we are seeing a lot of customers now using Presto for federated queries. Another interesting use case is uh, uh, Redshift replacement. Uh, anyone who is looking for uh, the Redshift replacement finds Presto uh, the best bet, mainly because Presto is uh, ANSI SQL. So it is uh, very easy for the users 
to migrate from Redshift, which is also ANSYS SQL. They just have to bring in their workloads and get started on Presto. There are, you don't have to spend a lot of time in educating yourselves or your users to move from Redshift to Presto. And finally, a uh, new trend is coming up in terms of ETL. Now, uh, initially, Presto wasn't recommended as the ETL engine. It is still not recommended as an ETL engine for very large ETLs. But people uh, are doing the ETLs if their workloads, if, if the data sizes are in few terabytes, uh, because they're getting much better performance from Presto with least amount of configurations from their end required. So the ETL workload is also picking up pace uh, in Presto. All right, so I uh, this is actually the end of presentation. I had an appendix which covers uh, the multiple solutions which uh, provide Presto. Uh, I think we have some time. I can spend some time to just walk you over um, this table. So this is basically uh, covering Presto, open source Presto, which uh, is assumed that you are trying on your own EC2 machines. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, versus uh, Presto uh, being run on EMR versus Athena, and then finally Kubol Presto. Uh, this is again following the same themes which we saw initially when we saw uh, Presto as a service at Kubol. So in terms of user experience, so this feature matrix provides what best each of uh, these services do. So in open source, you can always get the latest version. And open source is the benchmark, right? So you, the performance, the user experience is benchmark. Rest of them provide additional things on top of it. In EMR Presto, uh, you don't get the most recent version, but uh, still uh, a version which is very close to the latest version is available. But you have to deal with some configurations. Uh, certain parts of it has, have to be taken care of by you or via certain scripts. So management is completely via bootstraps and scripts. While the opposite end of this is Athena, where there is zero configuration, it is a serverless model where you don't have to uh, bring up clusters. The clusters are handled by uh, Athena service, and you just fire queries at it. And it is always up. You don't have to wait for your clusters to come up. So you just issue queries at it. And at the Kubol side, you get a larger functionality set. Most of this, the topics which are in Kubol Presto are already covered. You get more extensions, better integrations. And uh, very importantly, you get a fully uh, managed service, which is completely automated in terms of configurations and management and lifecycle management as well. In terms of performance enhancers, uh, the uh, OSS and EMR and Athena, all of them are uh, at the baseline, what open source Presto provides, while Kubol Presto has some additional features for better performance, as we saw in terms of join reorders and dynamic filtering. In terms of cost savers, you'll get spot support from EMR Presto as well, but it is not fault tolerant. So whatever I explained, that's not available. So if your node loss happens, your queries will fail, but you can still bring up Presto on spot nodes. For Athena, you could save money by paying only for what you use, because you're not having clusters, you're only paying for the usage. While on Kubol side, as we covered, that you could save a lot of money using auto-scaling and using fault-tolerant spot nodes integration. Security also we had covered in details when, when you're talking about features in Kubol Presto. Uh, so all of that is only available in Kubol Presto. Um, so uh, for an enterprise-ready Presto deployment, uh, Kubol Presto is very well suited. Uh, same goes for insights as well. The uh, data intelligence and data doc integration, which I talked about earlier, is only available in Kubol Presto. In terms of ecosystem, you would find uh, in open source, you'll find open source ODBC and JDBC drivers. While for EMR, apart from the drivers, you will find uh, a UI also uh, from AirPal, which is uh, Airbnb's project. So, But uh, the catch here is that you have to go through an additional step to set up AirPal and uh, bear additional cost of the node where AirPal is running. In Athena, you'll get a UI, uh, which Athena provides by itself. You know, so you'll also get JDBC and ODBC drivers. While in Kubol, you get a wide set of uh, drivers, SDKs, REST calls, and uh, Zeppelin notebooks. Finally, uh, in terms of control, uh, uh, EMR, uh, Open Source Presto, and Kubol, all of them provide you full control because it's your clusters which are running on your accounts. While in Athena, it's a managed service, so you have no controls. What it means is that, uh, for example, if you want to do a federated query, you cannot do it in Athena. You can do it in either of the other three 
uh, Presto installations. You, you don't have control about configurations, right? So you give up all of that for the ease of use uh, in case of Athena. This brings me to the end of the presentation. All right, folks, thanks for joining. Uh, I'll be exiting the webinar now.